I'm very, very excited. It's incredible to see this actually come reality. First time it's been to America, and the only one in America. Yeah. More than that, the only one in North America. Today's an amazing day because Michael Phillips is here, the master printmaker who's you know, really behind this replica press that is just like the one that William Blake would have used to make his masterworks. Dr. Alexander Regier from our Department of English and in the School of Humanities has been a scholar of William Blake for many years and so has been aware along the way of Michael Phillips' work making these recreations. Nobody took this up after Blake because it's so labor intensive. It's not possible to access William Blake's original plates. Having these recreations is really amazing. Hand over hand. Oh, nice. With Alexander, he got in touch with me and wanted to see the press and I welcomed the idea of his having a chance to meet me in Oxford where it was on loan in Christchurch Upper Library. And there we spent the day together uh, printing on it and he was enthralled by it. Oh my God, that's extraordinary. And then when the occasion arose about six or eight months ago that Christchurch no longer had space for the press and wanted it removed. Alexander was one of the first, if not the first person that I um, wrote to, to say, I don't know if this would be of interest, but I've got to find a new home for the press. And he said, give me 24 hours. That's the only one there is. So, and you know, uh, in that regard, it was fantastic to be able to bring it here and bring it here permanently. There we go, there we go. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Oh, it's a nice little peanut. Whoa! And to have it as a research and a teaching tool that really will change the way that we can teach, not just Blake here, but you know, history, book history, of course, but also material culture, uh, and all sorts of other sort of uh, areas and aspects. This is known as putting it into register. Okay, continuous, no stop. Got it. Okay. This is the moment. There you go. Wow. It looks really good. It is ridiculous. It's really amazing to kind of be able to imagine being back in time and seeing Blake work basically. Like what he, the kind of labor that he went through to produce these things that now we think of as just ubiquitous because you can go to the library and get a facsimile of Songs of Innocence and of Experience. But learning how few that there actually were when Michael was telling us, you know, there's only like 33 copies of this thing that ever existed in the history of the world. And now they're so easily accessible online. Um, but seeing the amount of labor that goes into producing these things and how much they were loved at the time, I think that's really something that's kind of, I'm going to take away with me today is just how much Blake loved his work. It just re revitalizes my kind of, my, my, my own work and what, can, what you can get from it, I guess. This, it's one of my favorites because it has Blake's name on it. <laughs> which is like... Specifically, I mean, for Blake's scholarship, it's a huge deal. The kind of proximity that you can have with the kind of text that Blake would have actually been working with is massively increased, but then just, in a more theoretical sense, you know, this is like, just changes your perspective on the archive. It acts like a drastically expanded archive because this is not just a, an artifactual archive or a, a text, but rather, you know, it's a kind of an archived process. Hand over hand. It's now been acquisitioned by uh, the Fondren Library f to be a permanent feature of this library. and a press to be used. That's the great difference. It's not just an antique with a lock on it, it's here to be used, um, and hopefully a lot. It's a wonderful, wonderful machine. It's extraordinary. It's like building a wooden ship and sailing around the world, and after you've sailed around the world in it, you're rather reluctant to see it go, but there it is.